Hello. In this lecture, we will look at Greek art and culture from the early geometric and archaic period that started right around 900 BCE through the Hellenistic period, which ends with the Roman Empire conquering Greece uh, in the first century BCE, right around 31 or so. Greek art and culture goes through uh, four major periods. First is archaic, uh, also known as geometric, with the establishment of what Greek culture is and their practices. And then two classical periods, the early classical and the high classical. And then finally, Hellenism, which is ushered in with uh, by Alexander the Great and his conquer of the Persian Empire and creation of the Hellenistic Empire, which is Greek inspired and Greek influenced, um, but also has elements of Persian art and culture. Now, um, Greek art is actually a, um, a, a descendant, uh, the Greeks are descendants of earlier peoples who lived in the region known as the Aegeans. The Aegeans were, um, were island people like the Greeks. They had developed civilizations and cultures uh, a thousand or to between a thousand and fifteen hundred years before Greek culture emerges. Um, but the Aegeans had um, Aegean civilization had faltered and had been conquered by the Persians. And then over time, the Greek city states emerged uh, and to uh, throw off Persian rule and authority and establish their own Senate and their own league of city states, um, all somewhat independent, but certainly connected as Greeks. And they were influenced by the cultures around them, most notably the, the, the Aegean, and most notably the, um, the Persians. Now, when we talk about Greek classicism, there's, there's, it's classic with a capital C. And so when you see that in your text or you see that in writing and, or in research, what, you're, what they're talking about is a specific time period of Greek history. So classical art is Greek art from, about, from be, between about the years 750 BCE to about 300 BCE. That, that 450 years of history and culture is the classical. And it's one of the most influential arts and cultures in all of history. We still see the evidence of the classical, the influence of it in everything that we do um, and in our culture in the West. We see it in our architecture. We see it in what we consider realism. We see it in what we think of as uh, as what is beautiful, um, we see and feel their influence um, and the influence of classicism in, in all art and culture. Now, initially, Greek art focuses on, during the archaic period, focuses on the establishment of Greek orders. Now, the Greeks believed that through rational, intellectual, logical, reasoned thought that man could create what they um, saw in the natural world around them and they could recreate that realistically in sculpture and they could create a reasoned and proportioned architecture that would lead to beauty. Now remember we talked about in the first half of the semester that beauty is not pretty, that beauty is perfection. And you attain, attain that perfection through a combination of realism and order. Now when we think about realism, we tend to think about um, something that matches what we see 
in nature, something that matches what we believe to be uh, a reflection of reality. Now, to them, there's realism takes many forms. Realism was physical, realism was intellectual, and realism was spiritual. And how you get that level of realism is through an orderly progression that that there is a formula, basically, and that if you follow that formula and you have enough elements of realism, that you will achieve beauty. In architecture, the, there are three Greek orders. Um, some scholars only see the first two, Doric and Ionic, as purely Greek and label Corinthian as a Roman version of Greek order <clears throat> because the, the Romans were more uh, used Corinthian most often and as such it was seen really more as Roman than it was Greek. But all three are Greek architectural orders and were used in Greek structures, most notably in Greek temples. Basically, the, uh, the orders, the different orders, are variations on the use of different elements to create a structure. They used columns, the shape and size and scale and decoration and design of those columns determines what order it is. So you see in the Doric order on the left that the columns are wider at the base than they are at the, at the capital, that the capital is a simple flare cap, it's not very decorative. Um, Doric is the simplest of the orders. It's also the oldest. Doric structures uh, are the most famous and iconic structures in all of Greek art and culture. The Parthenon, the most famous Greek temple, is a Doric temple. Now, the, um, the, the temples were consistently built on a pedestal base, usually three steps. And then above the columns that create the structure, the colonnade is, uh, would, would wrap around the exterior and create the structure. There's the pediment, which is the triangle-shaped roof structure, and that sits on top of the architrave and the frieze. Now, all three orders have the same basic elements. It's the details and the use of those elements, the number of columns, the arrangement of columns, uh, and the, the structure that create the variation between, uh, b between temples. Now, the Ionic order has columns that are simpler, that are uh, thinner, that are more delicate, that, are, that, that have a, a base, a flared base, and their capital has a scroll form because Iona saw itself as an intellectual city. They had a, a library of thousands of scrolls, um, tens of thousands. And as such, they wanted to have a style, an architectural style, that would reflect what they saw as their, um, as their nature, as their character and identity as being uh, intellectuals. Now, the Corinthian capital ha incorporates, it takes the same column structure as the Ionic, but it incorporates the acanthus leaf. That leaf form that um, you see there is very, uh, it resembles the leaves of the acanthus tree. Acanthus trees were sacred in the ancient world. In fact, they're still held sacred today. Um, Acanthus wood and acanthus leaves are used in sacred objects, and the leaves are actually used to make um, the most common form of uh, incense used in religious ritual. So C Corinth was a religious city and a religious center, and it's surrounded by, in the hills that surround the city, by groves of these acanthus trees. And so which the, those trees were protected uh, by law, and as such, they were, um, the, the Corinth had this uh, identity as a religious city and religious center. Now, in terms of sculpture, 
that order and perfection comes from uh, the development of what is called the canon of proportions. The canon of proportions was eventually written and added to by two high classical sculptors, Myron and Polyclitus, but it was older than that. And it, it said that to create the perfect human form in sculpture, you needed to follow the, the, uh, the formula uh, of proportion based upon the measurement of the human head. So the shoulders should be three heads wide, the waist should be two heads wide, the hips should be two and a half heads wide, uh, the torso should be three heads tall from the base of the neck to the hip, the, from the hip to the knee should be three heads, and from the knee to the ankle should be two heads. So basically it's a three to five ratio and from top to bottom of the torso to the, to the below the waist. Um, but it's not just physical form. Uh, the, the sculpture is also intended to depict the perfect uh, demeanor, the perfect age, the perfect uh, attitude and identity. You don't show a great deal of emotion. They believe that logic should be more, uh, should, and, and reasoning should win out over emotion. They saw emotions as weakness. And they also believed that uh, one of the, the most important tenets of Greek, uh, Greek culture and of Greek philosophy was that man was the measure of all things. That if given enough time, information, and opportunity, that man could figure out just about everything uh, that there was to figure out in the world, that we could understand and manipulate the natural world, and that all we needed was that opportunity to do so. Now, the so this sculpture, not only does it represent perfection in terms of what they see as idealized physical form, but it also represents that demeanor. Uh, he strides forward to show progress, to show movement, to show balance. He's his eyes are slightly exaggerated and enlarged to show that he's observing and witness to the world. His face is almost expressionless to show that he's, uh, he's not ruled by his emotions. And he is what they, the Greeks considered to be the ideal age. Now, this really has less to do with age than it has to do with the, the way that they viewed humanity. Uh, and the and the arc of human life, the, the but but they did see that um, you are about as as perfect as you're going to get physically at about 19 years old. After that, as you age, your body starts to deteriorate as you you know you use it and it wears out. But they believed that you could overcome that through wisdom and experience, and that that we were as individuals. We're always in the process of perfecting ourselves or of deteriorating. So you're either getting better or you're getting worse. And what you need to do is concentrate on always improving, always getting better. And then that makes us uh, part of, of a classical view of culture. Now, this wasn't just for, for the male. The female had this same canon of proportions, um, but you know, a significant difference. Now, this is the original on the left and a recreation on the right. We first want to deal with the painting. Um, we tend to think of Greek sculpture as being uh, white marble or, or stone or, you know, raw like that. But that's not at all the case. They painted their sculptures. They painted their structures. They, they loved bright colors. Um, they saw that as uh, a part of the, you know, the realism. And so as such, they would have painted their sculptures. They would have and they would have looked uh, much similar to the recreation on the right than just the raw stone. Now, they painted them with tempera paint, which is an egg-based old form of paint um, that we learned about in the first half of the semester. And tempera, um, while it is, uh, it's rather, you can, you can get bright colors and it's rather bright and it's uh, and it's relatively durable. It will break down with water over time. And that's partly what's happened is that the temper has washed away and worn away. Now you'll notice another difference between the male and females that the male was unclothed and the females clothed. 
That has to do with the nature of man versus woman. Men um, were supposed to be the hero, and the heroes are depicted like the gods, and the gods, are, especially the male gods, are depicted in the nude because of their perfection and their immortality. And so as such, because the, the idealized man is supposed to be a hero like a god, so he doesn't need clothes, and he's also perfect, so there's no point in hiding the perfection. Now, women, on the other hand, are most often depicted clothed because women are supposed to have decorum. Women are supposed to have modesty, and they're supposed to not, um, and because they're not like, they're not heroes uh, like the male, um, they they don't have the same, uh, they're not depicted in the same way. They're depicted fully clothed. In terms of the expression of that, those architectural forms, what we see as the we move from the archaic into the classical is we see that the, the style evolves not in drastic changes, but in subtle differences in proportion and in uh, overall design. So this is the Temple of, a, the, of Aphia Aegina. Um, it is an early classical uh, Doric temple. It, uh, it was built in... Um, a the, a style known as uh, he Hepa style temple. Um, it is uh, it has a, a row of columns all the the way around the outside, and then another interior row of columns that created the interior space that uh, that were that bounded the out uh, the the walls of the cella, which is the the room inside the temple. Um, and remember, this is not a temple that would be used for corporate worship. They're not gathering to worship together. Uh, the priests would enter the temple with offerings, and other individuals could enter the temple. And inside the temple, there would have been a large-scale uh, sculpted portrait of the deity or, the, or god or goddess to whom the temple was dedicated. And then, um, but most of the, the actual... Um, Use of the temple would happen in the courtyard area and the and the porticos outside. People would gather to hear stories and learn lessons about the gods and goddesses, to have discussions and and talk about the nature of philosophy. Um, and that would happen outside the temple, not necessarily inside the cella. This is a pediment sculpture. So this would have been in that triangular wedge-shaped ed edge of the pediment. Um, and this is a, a dying Greek. Now, the, the Greeks viewed life and death differently than a lot of the other ancient cultures. They, they really didn't um, focus on any kind of afterlife. They, they believed in an afterlife, but they just they weren't sure exactly what form it took. Um, and as such, instead of focusing on, um, you know, on preparing, funerary monuments or anything like that, the Greeks tended to ask after the death of an individual, um, what was more important to them was how did they live? Did they live well? Did they use the time here, their time here on earth wisely to develop themselves, to pass on their knowledge and wisdom and experience to the next generation? Um, and then how did they die? Did they die well? Was their death um, the, the, the Greeks viewed death really as uh, one of two ways. It was either comic or tragic. And in most Greek stories, Greek myths, Greek legends, Greek literature, you, you see that. Um, in a Greek story, somebody almost always dies. And very often it's the main character, which is, you know, can be kind of disappointing um, that the hero dies. But after their death, what they ask is, you know, did they die in vain, which would make it comic, or did they die in service, or in, you know, was it a, a good death at the end of a good life? And if so, then their death would be tragic, but it would be part of the natural order of things. They didn't see life and death as being, um, you know, something to, or, or as opposites. They saw death as part of life. It was part of the, the natural progression of life. And so they wanted to just know that you used the time that you had here on earth well. So here, the dying Greek, who's you know pulling the arrow from his chest, he still, even though he's dying, has that sort of beautific, 
look on his face. He still uh, looks like he's struggling to get up to um, uh, to to get back into the fight. Um, he he doesn't you know he's he's not looking down. He's looking up. He's he's still kind of maintaining this positive, balanced attitude. Now, in in contrast is the dying Gaul. The Greeks viewed the Gauls as kind of, that was a word they used for everybody other than the Greeks. It, they were not really necessarily their enemies, but their opposites. You know, the Greeks believed that there were two types of people in the world, the Greeks and the people who wanted to be Greeks. And so, you know, the, or, or who, who should have been Greeks and should act like Greeks. Um, and so the Gauls were a, a physical people. They, they lived more to the north in the Mediterranean, but they were also... Uh, anyone non non classical basically, and so the Gaul is dying, and he looks down, and he looks uh, defeated, and he still clings to his shield, and he you know all those things that um, are not a reflection of you know the understanding of Greek classicism. The form is very realistic as Greek sculpture evolved over time we see the the level of understanding of realism and form uh, gets much much greater very quickly because they believed in the the power of um, the evolution of style so you should learn from the previous generation who should learn from you and style should always be evolving towards a higher level of perfection and that's that's a different view of how of what art and culture should should do because you know, like in, in Egypt, they were isolationist and they were con conservative and they tried to stay the same versus the Greeks who were always trying to improve or get better. Now, in Greek culture, there are a few, just like with every culture in Egypt, it's the pyramids, and Mesopotamia, it's Babylon, and Persepolis. And in the Greek culture, there's this iconic, these iconic structures. And the most important is uh, in Athens, the Acropolis. The Acropolis is the hill that overlooked the ancient city, and on top of that hill they built several temples to Athena, and the most important of those temples is the Parthenon. The Parthenon was considered by classical Greeks to be the perfect Greek temple form. It's uh, built in a Doric style, which was the most common in um, in, uh, in Athenian architecture. And the uh, when we examine its style, it was considered perfect because of its balance in proportion, from height to width to length, from the scale of the columns themselves, uh, all of that in relationship to us, to the viewer. It's a, a very impressive structure. Now, again, we it's it's today in ruin because over time it has deteriorated um, and mostly deteriorated because of our intervention. We bombed it, we've blown it up, uh, we've done all kinds of, of things to, to damage it. Um, but it's, um, it's one of those structures that has become so, not just iconic in itself, but so influential. We see this type of Greek temple front this kind this type of architecture all over uh, our culture especially here in America and in the West um, we see this type of form in our government buildings in our uh, you know financial buildings in, in all kinds of structures um, even in our homes the use of columns to create a porch to create a portico to create an entryway um, the, the triangle shaped pediment for the roof. We, we see this type of architecture everywhere. And that's partly why it's been so influential is that it will always be seen as classically beautiful. Now, um, this is a recreation of the Parthenon that was built in Nashville uh, in the, the 1970s. Uh, it's made from concrete instead of marble, but still rather impressive. And we believe that this is as historically accurate as we can make it. Um, we, they, as they were building it, they tried not to uh, add any elements that they could not prove or relatively prove to be accurate. 
Um, so all of the details are as accurate as they make, can make them. Um, if you get a chance to visit, it's a, a remarkable structure, and I, I really recommend that you you take the opportunity. It's in West Nashville, um, in, near uh, the Vanderbilt campus. Um, the uh, the exterior has all the pediment sculpture and carvings and relief, and the interior there's actually a forty foot statue to Athena that um, his we believe is an exact duplicate or recreation of the one that was inside the original Parthenon. The Greeks didn't only build temples, of course. They built all kinds of structures, uh, agoras for markets and arenas for games and athletic contests. Um, and then, of course, theaters. The Greeks were, we credit the Greeks with the invention of many things, so, uh, theater included, um, and their dramas were a little bit different than what we think of as theater. Their theatrical performances were mostly um, it, the telling of epic poems or tales, soliloquies, uh, sometimes uh, uh, some uh, interaction between characters, but not elaborate sets or like we would think of as theater today. As such, their theaters were a little different. Um, they didn't have a flat horizontal stage. Instead, they had a vertical stage. That wall of arches is actually the stage. And the, the characters, the, the performers, would appear in those arches uh, lit by torches, and they would, um, they would say their, their lines or tell their poems. Um, and the natural acoustics of the amphitheater, the, of the curved amphitheater, which would catch the sound, would actually uh, help the the audience to hear now the they built these theaters and these and, and all of the greek structures in every major greek city in every place they went and that was also something kind of unique to greek culture that it wasn't uh, it was sort of transferable you know it's all about following the order it's about following the the um the formula so you don't just build a, a temple here, a temple there. There's a temple, multiple temples in every Greek city. You build an amphitheater every Greek city. You build an arena. You build an agora. You build all these things in every city. So when they had a new city or cities would develop, they would, over time, build all of these structures. They're built mostly with marble and granite and irregular stone uh, masonry using uh, cement and concrete and mortar to hold them together, something they learned from the Aegeans. And... Um, they don't quite have concrete just yet. They have cement, but not concrete. Uh, it won't be told the Romans that we get true concrete. Now, in high classical sculpture, they take the perfection of form of archaic with the, the koros, the, the idealized uh, male and female forms, and they apply that to now have a, a figure that's going to have a little bit more vitality. It's going to have a little bit more movement. It's going to have a little bit more meaning behind it. It's not just an idealized figure. So we start to see images like the one on the right by Myron, the Discobolos, the discus thrower, an athlete uh, in the midst of performing. Uh, the figure on the left is Aphrodite by Polyclitus, um, and she's the goddess of beauty. And it's so it's it's really more adding elements of realism. What do they see in nature? How pe how human beings move. And trying to make the sculptures reflect that movement. Not not quite that they are moving, but they look like they could, or they're captured in the in, you know frozen in time. Um, and then of course adding the detail. So so the details are finer. Um, the the level of carving is better. We see the veins. We see the muscles. We see the the skeletal structure. We see all those details that make it look even more realistic. And this has happened in a very short period of time, relatively, just in a few, couple of hundred years, we've gone from the basics of form in realism to now a high level of realism in detail. Now, at the end of the High Classical, we see uh, Alexander in 323 BCE is, Alexander is a, well, he's, he is claimed by the Greeks, but he's probably Macedonian. Not probably, he's Macedonian, um, which is one of their neighbors. And he's part Persian as well. So he's 
he's some Greek, he's got some Greek like ancestry, but he's born in Macedonia, and to and his mother's family was also Persian. So he's he's sort of a composite in his ancestry, and as such, he and he rises to some uh, level of authority and power in his uh, in his with through his military prowess and leadership, and he goes on a campaign to defeat the Persian king, Darius, and he manages to do so. And as such, as he after he defeats Darius and the, the Persians, he claims the throne of Persia and becomes the king of the of Persia and Greece. Now, the Greeks didn't call themselves Greeks. They called themselves Hellenes. And so he referred to his own uh, empire and his own kingdom as the Hellenes, the, and so hence the Hellenistic. Persian art didn't see, and Persian culture did not see emotion and, as weakness. They saw emotion as the part of humanity, just like our physical form is part of, part of us, our emotions are part of us, and our intellect is part of us. So Hellenism adds to the Greek idealism of logic and reasoning and man being the measure of all things, Hellenism adds the element of emotion. So it's trying to make art and culture that is um, both logical and reasoned and finding beauty based upon or on uh, our emotions. And so as such, it's trying to add a sense of drama. This is the altar of Zeus built in Pergamon. Now, the scale of this structure is massive, and it was built in a Roman style. You can see ionic columns, you can see, but it has elements that are Persian. The flat roof is much more Persian, and then the scale, right? So the Greeks were all about balance and proportion. Hellenism is going to be more uh, this grand gestural scale that, that was common in Persia, and have the sculpture reflect uh, an element of the the uh, dramatic, um, you know, more emotional side of humanity. This is the Nike of Samothrace. Now, we we're more familiar with the word Nike, pronounced Nike. Um, you know, they make shoes and stuff, but Nike means victory in Greek, and they saw victory as this allegorical figure. She. Uh, she comes on wings and sent by the gods to give us victory, to give us support and help. Um, she could be seen or unseen. She what the she was a servant. The Nike were servants of the gods, um, and so you know she. It, this sculpture at one point would had would have had arms outstretched, uh, like she was flying, and of course the head's been removed. Um, with the and the wings fully open, and the idea here is that it was she was supposed to be captured in flight. So the wind, as she's flying, is blowing her tunic and and uh, robes around her body to, and that shows off the form. Now, the the level of the skill of carving has dramatically improved. They're using finer chisels, better tools, pneumatic drills to get. Um, this really, really in high level of carving uh, to get this uh, this dramatic form. We see a, a great number of details that we wouldn't have seen in previous generations. We see, uh, you know, the, the the lines of the feathers. We see the the way that the drape wraps around the body, and that really shows off the um, <clears throat> or creates that sense of the drama. Now, as we move through Hellenism and towards uh, the Roman Empire, the, the time of the Romans, which we'll talk about in a future video, what, what we see added to art is the desire to not just capture realism and form and beauty and perfection and order, but also for a, to use art for a purpose, that art should tell tales and lessons and provide moral instruction to the viewer. So Hellenistic art, as it adds that sense of drama, 
it's there's a the reason why that drama is important is because we can learn from it. We can develop our own beliefs, and that's a that should be a part of our development process is to to develop our beliefs and to develop our morality. So this is this sculpture is uh, typical of the period. It's called Laocoon and his sons. Laocoon <clears throat> was an actual person who lived um, and a, the, the character in this story. Laocoon was a priest, and as such, he was one of the keepers of their morality and an important figure in his village. And he had two sons. Laocoon's sons were young, they were courageous, they were strong, they were smart, they were all the things that you know young men should be, but they were also impatient. And Laocoon tried to convince them that they needed to not not to seek glory, but simply to you know respond to life as it happened and but to be prepared to respond well. So their village was uh, was plagued by a monster serpent. You know, in the Greek stories, there's always a always a monster, and so this serpent was had uh, plagued the village for years, and so the the sons, Laocoon's sons, were determined to go attack the serpent and kill the serpent, and then that would bring them and their family glory and honor, and it would help their village. So that seems like a good thing, except Laocoon tried to convince them that they weren't ready, that they weren't, not that they weren't strong and courageous, but they weren't experienced enough. They weren't ready to uh, to defeat the serpent, and that if they went, that they would surely die, and he didn't want that to happen. But being young and, and you know, not, not experienced enough, they decided to go anyway and to not listen to their father. So when Laocoon heard that his sons had gone to, to, to try and defeat the serpent, he knew that they would be killed. He tried to, um, to save them. So he went to the serpent's lair, and he saw them wrapped up and coiled up in the, in the serpent, and he waded in to try and save them. Now, in true Greek fashion, it's a comedy or a tragedy, so you have to, you know, it depends on how you look at the death, at, at what happens. And in our way of thinking, in our classically inspired world today, we would um, think that it was the son's fault, so the sons should be the ones to receive the punishment and be held accountable. But in a true Greek fashion, and the, the way that they viewed life, um, they they saw it as fitting, and so as such, Laocoon is the one who dies. His sons, he manages to free the sons, they escape, but Laocoon is bitten by the serpent, and he dies. And so this is that point where he's freed his sons, or freeing his sons, but he has to give up his life to do it. Now, <clears throat> we might think that's tragic, but from the Greek point of view, it's not quite a tragic death. While it's unfortunate, it's not quite tragic. It's really, to them, more comic. And the reason it's comic is because if he had done what he's supposed to do as a priest and as a father and trained his sons to listen to wisdom and reason, to follow um, the order of things and not seek out glory on their own but, <clears throat> but be prepared, and, and, you know, use knowledge and wisdom and experience, not just of their own, but of others, then he wouldn't have died. And his sons wouldn't have disobeyed and gone off to do, uh, to try and defeat the serpent. The sculpture itself shows the misery in Laocoon's face. It shows a, a high level of realism in the form. The muscles are rippling, and they're in the midst of that combat with the serpent. Um, and you know, all of that is a reflection of Hellenistic style. So we've seen that through the, the evolution of these sculptures, the, the form go from realistic but, um, but lacking of, of any science of the movement 
to adding that element of movement in the high classical to now adding the element of the narrative, the story in the Hellenistic. Um, you know, the Greek art and culture was in all things. It wasn't just in the, the special or the, the, the public. It was in the everyday. So they applied the same, um, same types of imagery, the same use of imagery to tell moral lessons and tales, uh, to, to simple things right down to the, the china, you know, the, to the, the, the ceramic ware that they used in, in eating and cooking every day. So these are called craters. Uh, the, well, the object on the left is a crater. The object on the right is an amphora. It's a, they are uh, ceramic vessels painted with red on black technique. So there's two types, two colored slips to paint the images on the outside before it's fired. And they took that opportunity to paint uh, images that would help us, uh, remind us as we're eating and drinking and celebrating to, that balance and proportion in all things is uh, important in life. So on the, the object on the left would have been used to um, mix uh, drink, basically. Uh, it's, uh, they mixed water and wine together. They mixed uh, new wine, which is very uh, uh, high alcohol content, but also kind of bitter. Um, but they mixed that with the water to kill the bacteria in the water and made kind of a punch, basically, and um, that they drank communally at celebrations. So everyone would share this big vessel and you'd grasp those two handles and take a drink and then wipe the rim before you passed it on to the next person. And on the outside, there's an image of Bacchus, who's, uh, or uh, actually Dionysus in this case, because the Greek, Rome, the Roman version is Bacchus. Um, it's the, the god of wine and spirits and the god of celebration. And, but the imagery is telling us moderation. So it's really about, okay, don't drink too much of the wine um, because it will uh, inhibit your reason and your logic. And so even on the outside of these vessels, they're using that opportunity to tell a moral tale, to, to improve our thinking and logic and reasoning uh, as we celebrate. Greek art and culture was about this search and goal for perfection. That's classicism. And even though classicism ended 2,300 years ago, we still feel its effects today. We still see it as a vital and important part of culture as we try and uh, find that path to perfection through realism. All right, we'll look at Roman art in the next video.